Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar today on Decolonizing Science Writing, co-hosted by the Center for Science and Media at the School of Journalism and Media Studies at SDSU and the San Diego Science Writers Association. I am Dr. Amy Schmitz-Weiss, journalism professor in the School of JMS. I will be your co-host today, along with Ramin Skiba, president of the San Diego Science Writers Association and science journalist. Ramin will be starting our panel shortly. During this panel, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. Please type it in the Q&A box and we'll get to the questions in the second half. Before we get started, I wanted to acknowledge that for millennia, the Kumeyaay people have been a part of this land. This land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the San Diego State University community, we acknowledge this legacy. We promote this balance and harmony. We find inspiration from this land, the land of the Kumeyaay. We will now get started. Let's turn it over to Ramin. Thank you, Amy. Uh, this this uh, webinar came out of a collaboration between Sansfoa and uh, uh, SDSU, and I'm uh, glad that this is this is finally coming together. Sansfoa is the San Diego uh, Science Writers Association, and if you're not a member and want to join, I encourage you to. Um, there is also a uh, Monica May, one of our members, has started a uh, uh, social justice and science writing group, and its first meeting is next Tuesday uh, at 5:30. Uh, December 8th, and but you do have to be a member. So, so uh, join if you want to uh, come to that uh, club. So that'll be the first meeting next week. So the, just to talk about the origin of this event, um, you know, with the uh, Black Lives Matter led movement, uh, protest movement this, this year, it caught on in a way that it, that it hadn't before. Uh, there was a huge shift in public opinion and uh, people started, uh, people talked more seriously about criminal justice reform and as well as other kinds of uh, inequalities and disparities in, uh, in the workplace, in education, in healthcare. And uh, some of those involve science writing and science journalism, uh, such as with COVID and climate change and, and what have you. And so, so, this, so this event is, is to help us all work more and work better on uh, improving our, our, our writing and reporting so that we're uh, thinking more about uh, these, dis these disparities and also thinking about you know, how we pick our stories how we pick our sources, how we interview them and characterize them in the stories, you know, how we frame frame them, um, and you know, uh, and, and and of course there's sometimes resistance. So you, you have to think about you know do, what fits well with with what's appropriate for what publication, and so these are all different kinds of questions we can talk about uh, today. Um, and uh, um, let's see, is there anything else? Um, so I'll. Uh, I'll just uh, keep the introduction short so we can get straight to the uh, uh, interesting discussions we have coming up. Um, our uh, speakers uh, include Jane Hu, a freelance journalist in Seattle. She's a contributing editor at High Country News and a regular contributor at Slate. Uh, Jerry McCormick is a uh, producer and communications professional, um, and he's a lecturer at the School of Journalism and Media Studies at SDSU. He's also a senior public information officer for the city of San Diego. Uh, and then there's Shilina, Shilina Chatlani. Uh, she, uh, up until recently, was the science and technology reporter for uh, KPBS, our, our local NPR station. And uh, David Codden, a longtime lecturer in journalism at uh, San Diego State University. So, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll start us up by uh, uh, directing it to you, uh, Jane. Um, so if you want to introduce yourself, and, and also um, I was uh, going to ask you about a couple of uh, stories you've written um, such as, uh, you know, for, for uh, Slate, you've written about how police tactics with protesters uh, 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 can potentially involve spreading COVID. And also you've written about uh, uh, unlikely hikers for High Country News, just, just a couple that came to mind. Yeah, thanks so much, Ramin, and thanks for having me. Um, like Ramin said, I am a freelance science journalist. Um, I live in Seattle. And you know, it's funny when you said that I didn't actually consider any of those pieces to be explicitly about race. Um, although they obviously do in, in intersect with race in really important ways. Um, and I think that's what is really important um, to address um, for stories to talk about identity, race and culture, um, but to not necessarily have that be like I, I at least in my experience I don't really go into it thinking I'm explicitly going to be writing a story about race I think that just ends up happening because race inevitably intersects with everything um, 
And also, I think it's really important to note that these marginalized communities are often on the leading edge of so many things. Um, and those perspectives are just really underrepresented in media. So that um, unlikely hiker story that you mentioned, for instance, does definitely involve race, but it's also about um, people's size, ableism, um, gender identity. And what was really interesting to me about that story was not so much just people's identities, although that's clearly a really important part of that story, but also how people in those identities reflected on their relationship to the outdoors in a way that I think really advanced the conversation about the state of the outdoors industry. Um, so I did that story a few years ago, um, and I feel like the conversation actually really has changed over the last few years as a result of their work, which really just shows how important it is, I think, to highlight these perspectives um, and to, to talk about identity as it relates to so many other important topics that we're talking about in society. That's great. Thanks, Jane. Um, I you couldn't see me, but I, I was nodding. I like your responses there. Um, uh, so, Jerry, uh, to, to, to switch to you, could you introduce yourself? Um, you know about what kind of what you work on, and also um, you've talked before about you know uh, uh, what COVID, how COVID coverage, COVID-related coverage could be better. Um, if you could talk about what you thought might be missing, or how how um, you know pandemic-related coverage could be improved. Sure. Thank you. Um, so my name is Jerry McCormick and I'm a longtime journalist in the San Diego area. Um, this COVID-19 story obviously is one of the stories of the year and it's been lacking a lot, especially in local media. Um, one of the stories that I haven't been seeing is the, who's really being affected by this. When I see stories, I see, you know, there's Jane in La Jolla and she feels sad that her husband is, is sick and he's in the hospital. But what about all the people, the essential workers that her husband has come in contact with? You know, the people at the grocery store, the people at the hair salon, those people who have no choice but to go out into society to make a living. You know, not, not all of us are lucky enough to work from home. And you know, this whole community of people seem to be the ones who are just being decimated by this disease. Um, even recently, the, the local newspaper in town, they did, a, they did a story about, you know, we crossed a milestone here in San Diego of a thousand people being killed, or sorry, dying from this disease in San Diego County. And I looked at these stories and the majority of the faces were of the same hue. Now that wasn't necessarily the fall of the paper. That was, you know, the stories that they got. But what about the, the people who they didn't get? You know, and I think part of that is because we don't have enough diversity in newsrooms in general. You tend to write what you know and you tend to stick to whom you know. And I just feel like, for example, science writers, I belong to an organization called the National Association of Black Journalists. And I've been a longtime member of this organization. Off the top of my head, I can't name five science writers or five of us who write about science. And one of the reasons for that is because <clears throat> newsrooms tend to set us up in certain areas like you cover sports, you cover crime and investigative journalism, science, that's, those areas seem to be reserved for certain people. You can express an interest in those areas, but it's not necessarily open to you. And I feel like with this coronavirus coverage that we've been getting, it's an opportunity for us to, you know, make some inroads to all sorts of communities. Those are good points. Thanks, Jerry. Um, so, Shalina, um, I wanted to ask you about that too. If, if you could introduce yourself and. and and uh, tell us about some of the reporting you've done for KPBS uh, involving COVID inequalities, like uh, involving the homeless population and uh, infections and unemployment uh, in, in Latino communities. Hi, thanks for having me here. Um, I was the former science reporter at KPBS. My last day was this week and I'm going on to be a healthcare reporter in the South. Um, so the stories that I did about those communities and coronavirus, um, didn't like come about because they just popped into my head. 
um, when, when the pandemic started. Um, you know, when I took on the role of science reporter, um, the, the first thing that I did was to make connections with a lot of community organizations. I spent weeks just reaching out to groups like the Chicano Federation, um, United Women of East Africa, because as much as you know, we, we say as journalists, we're objective, um, the reality is that our, our lived experiences and our perspectives on certain issues will inevitably affect the way that we write stories and who we talk to and how we come up with angles. Um, and so because I had sort of done that, that work on the front end of reaching out to different community organizations and having conversations about issues like trust in the government or um, you know, lack of aid um, in terms of employment, for example, it was then easy to come up with ideas about how to relate coronavirus to underserved communities in San Diego um, and find those connections during meetings um, with county supervisors, for example, where you could kind of catch what they're saying and go, oh, well, you're clearly not talking about this community um, or giving them enough time or um, attention. Um, and so that's, that's what happened with those stories. For example, in South Bay, listening to uh, meetings from county supervisors, you could hear that they weren't addressing the very real issue of the fact that, you know, while the Latino community is a third of the population in San Diego, there are 60% of coronavirus cases. And from there, with the example of trust, you can go, well, if that's the reality, how do you, how can San Diego leaders even make inroads with this community to alleviate the situation? Um, so those stories came out of that front end work of, of knowing where the disparities already are and knowing where those issues are for those communities and connecting the dots. Um, it's easy to just write about science in you know, a hard science kind of way, just regurgitating scientific literature. But unless you take the time to go and talk to communities that are underrepresented, you can't really make that connection um, because you don't have that perspective yourself. Um, so I came up with those stories because I talked to people who were you know, dealing with those issues on, on an everyday basis. Um, and so it was easy to, to come up with those ideas. Thanks, Jelena, that's great. Um, and then uh, David, could you introduce yourself and tell us, um, you know, maybe if you have some examples from uh, uh, classes you've taught, or maybe, you know, students want to uh, write about something involving racial injustice or racial inequality, you know, what kinds of guidance do you, you give them in, in that situation? Uh, hello, Ramin, thank you for having me today. Hello to everybody. Uh, yes, I am a longtime journalist, uh, more than 25 years at the newspaper here in San Diego, the Union Tribune, and uh, now uh, going on 13 years uh, as a lecturer at San Diego State. And it's really a privilege to work in higher education. And uh, this year in particular at San Diego State, uh, I teach a class called Media Writing for Scientists, uh, which I've taught for quite a few years here at SDSU. And um, the, the overarching message of the class, even before this year where COVID-19 is upon us, is that science is global and that it affects everybody and that we are all part of a global community, uh, not just journalists and scientists, but everyone. And in terms of approaching how to write about science and this year in particular, how to write about um, COVID-19, I've been emphasizing to my students and they seem to uh, pick up on this very quickly, the importance of thinking of us all as one planet, that this terrible virus is something that discriminates against no one. Everyone is impacted by it. And it isn't just people who are impacted by COVID-19, but also the people who are working to combat COVID-19. And one of the things we've been working on all semester long is thinking about and writing about um, the, uh, the virus and about the researchers who are trying to bring us a vaccine, uh, writing about people who are helping those who are very much in need because of COVID-19, writing about how we're all affected by it. 
uh, people of all races and ethnicities and religions um, and thinking of them as one and not just writing about it, but also our reading has changed. I think there's a lot of scientific literature about all scientific subjects, medical, health, technological, et cetera, aside from COVID-19. And I think what this year has done is emphasize the importance of looking for disparate voices in bylines, uh, as well as um, in the people that we write about. And I think the more we can do that, the more enlightened and democratic and universal our coverage will be. And my goal is to help future science writers, future science journalists, uh, approach their work on a global basis. Thanks, David, that's great. Um, uh, Jerry, I think you wanted to say something. Please go ahead. I think uh, what David said was super important. So thank you so much for that, David. And I just wanna say, I totally agree with what you're saying. When it comes to COVID-19, you know, for example, I'm a 52 year old fat gay black man and I'm a buffet for that disease. I mean, virus, you know, it's like, if it's gonna attack someone, it would attack me. And what I'm finding and what I'm seeing is I don't see myself reflected in some of the stories. Um, the last week I've been seeing a lot of stories about the virus, you know, and I'm sorry, not the virus, the vaccine and how the vaccine is gonna help all of these people and you know, who were getting it. Well, that vaccine is also an economic issue. What if you don't have health insurance? Where do you fall in line for something for, you know, where do you fall in line to get the vaccine? Will you get the vaccine? I mean, who determines whose life is more important than others? I mean, I feel like those stories, if we had a more diverse pool of writers and decision makers, those stories would be told. Thanks, Jerry. Um, I, uh, I also wanted to ask uh, Jane about uh, a piece uh, you wrote for The Open Notebook. Uh, that's an online uh, resource for science writers. You, you wrote about uh, sensitivity readers. Could you uh, tell us you know, what sensitivity readers are and when, uh, you know, when you might want to talk to one or work with one? Sure. Um, so sensitivity readers, really anyone who has lived experience that you think would offer valuable perspective to your piece. Um, I think that the primary time people think about using a sensitivity reader and that I would recommend you consider using one is when you are writing about a community that you don't belong to and that you don't have lived experience in. Um, I feel like I mentioned this in the piece as well that um, who can serve as a sensitivity reader is really broad. Um, it really just depends on your specific project. But I think that if you're writing about a community that you're not familiar with, um, having someone who is familiar with the culture of that group um, and to just kind of gut check you on what you've written can be really helpful um, and can point out things that you honestly just didn't know before. Um, like maybe there's a certain word that has a very specific connotation in that community that you just weren't aware of that. Um, so I describe it in the piece as similar to fact checking. And I think it is really important for journalists to think about it that way. Um, it's a similar check on accuracy. You basically just wanna make sure that your work is truthful, um, that it's thorough, and that you're really doing the story justice um, by kind of doing your full diligence and trying to understand community that you're reporting on. Um, yeah. Thanks, Jane. Um, so one thing I've been thinking about lately, just because of a couple of my own experiences is, you know, what what is appropriate for, you know, particular outlet, you know, I was, I was going to ask Shalina, you know, um, have you ever pitched a story involving, you know, racial injustices or something involving racism, where your editor is like, ah, I don't know if that's a good idea or or maybe uh, you know uh, you have so like a back and forth. Like, like how, how do you deal with that kind of situation? Yeah, that's totally happened to me. That's happened all throughout my career. Um, it, you know, for, for a specific example, when the coronavirus pandemic was just starting off, um, you know, I pitched to an, an editor to focus in on some you know international students in particular. 
um, who didn't have enough money to, to go buy their own laptop. And so they had to like stay on school and be exposed to the virus, stay on school campus and be, potentially be exposed to the virus. And um, there weren't, you know, there were not enough relief options for students like this. Um, but because there was so much going on, um, you know, the editor said, you know, that that story didn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. So it's an example of the types of issues that can come across sometimes when you're trying to pitch these stories about diverse characters. Um, what I'll say about that in terms of overcoming it is um, I think for any journalist that's writing about diversity and for any journalist of color who's trying to um, do something that's outside the norm, it's going to be challenging because you're going to have to explain to an editor or a coworker why you think it's important to have that perspective, which has historically not been valued um, in a spotlight um, because it's new. Um, and you know, my advice to anyone is to not be combat combative about it, um, but to instead try to bring whoever you're talking to into your realm of understanding, that's the best way to approach those stories and that issue. Because if you're combative about it, it's gonna make it more challenging um, for that person to see your point of view. Um, and, the, the, and the reason why you think that particular character needs to be put in a spotlight urgently um, because of, for example, the situation with the coronavirus pandemic, which is uh, disproportionately affecting low-income people of color. Um, so yeah, that's, that's happened all throughout my career. Um, and the best way that I've dealt with it is to not become flustered or frustrated, but instead to try to get whoever I'm talking to, to see why that particular perspective needs to be showcased right now because of some service it could do to our audience, um, or the people who, um, you know, could be listening to our news. Thanks, Jelena, that's a good point. Um, uh, David, uh, you had something to say, P please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ramin. I just wanted to point out that, you know, in addition to being a journalist myself and a, an instructor of journalism, I'm also a consumer of journalism. And I've been following like most of us have uh, the coverage of COVID-19 for many months now. And, you know, I think there has been a tendency to when, we, when people of color are spotlighted, uh, they tend to be in victim roles or people who have gotten the disease. Um, and uh, I think that there, there are some areas that have been neglected in coverage, one of which is the many people of color who vol have volunteered to be part of vaccine trials, uh, which have been in such an important process this year. And in addition to that, uh, people who have been researchers working to uh, bring us what we hope will be an effective vaccine or vaccines, that this is, uh, has been, again, to use the word I used earlier, a global effort, and that we need to reflect uh, the diversity of people who have been doing all of those other things, in addition to people who unfortunately have gotten sick or worse from uh, the coronavirus. One more thing, too, I, I think the coverage of COVID-19 from the beginning has become, has been, and has become very much a numbers issue, where we focus uh, as consumers on numbers and forget that there are people behind these numbers and there's a risk of becoming desensitized to uh, the people who are impacted by this disease. So I hope we're becoming more enlightened about this because we know this isn't going away for a while and that um, we will see some significant changes in coverage and how we, how we uh, evaluate the information that we get as well. Thanks, David. Uh, Shalina, uh, you, you had your hand raised. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I thought that David made a really good point um, in terms of you know this discussion on perspectives and, and how to get someone to understand why it's important to cover a particular community. Um, I think at the same time, it's also important for us as journalists to check ourselves um, in terms of how we think we are highlighting a particular community. Um, as David mentioned, you know, I think that there has been a lot of reporting during the pandemic that puts people of color into a victim role only. Um, and that also does a disservice to highlighting the 
perseverance of a lot of communities during this pandemic. Um, and I think there can be more of a, there can be more reporting that spans a spectrum in terms of how to highlight what these communities are going through. But in addition to, you know, talking to editors and coworkers about why they should be talking about these communities, it's important to do the work on the front end of actually going out into community organizations and talking to them about what they're experiencing before assuming that you know what they're experiencing. Um, that's been an issue in San Diego where, for example, county supervisors have often been talking about why there is a greater number of coronavirus cases in the Latino community and um, giving certain attributes to this community, like there are more essential workers or there, there's more housing insecurity, things like that, which is may is true. Like there, there, those are factors in those communities, but um, it's also true that housing insecurity and essential workers and those types of socioeconomic issues don't just exist within the South Bay, for example. Um, and so it's it's I'm, I, it's important to not paint with a broad brush what those communities are experiencing, and instead go out and ask people what they're experiencing, because that's when you get really to the core of the stories and why there are disparities. Um, so, you know, it's important at the same time while you're explaining things to also check yourself and see whether you are actually doing the work to go and understand the communities that you're reporting about. That's a good point. Thanks, Jelena. Um, uh, Jerry, you wanted to make a point. Please, please go ahead. Thank you. Shalina, I feel like you're taking us to um, science writing church here. And if there was a collection plate, I'd put five or $10 in it because you're exactly right. I mean, we need to check ourselves, but I think the, the point is we need to be in the room to check ourselves. And I think, you know, because newsrooms are, you know, I'll be honest, predominantly white, it's hard for us to be in these rooms. Um, because, you know, I think the stories that that's being produced, they're being produced for a particular audience. And I think as journalists, you know, we need to think about everyone. Like David said earlier, this is, you know, with the coronavirus, it's a global issue. So is climate change. You know, for example, last night we had a fire here in San Diego County and we have Santa Ana winds. Well, how does that affect me if I'm living in Southeast San Diego? You know, bring me into that story. Like when I watched the story, it was just tragic to see the hills and flames, but I saw that it in this neighborhood, which was pretty well to do. If I'm living paycheck to paycheck, do I care about those people? Maybe not, maybe, but tell me that because we have this weather condition that this could happen in your neighborhood. And this is what you can do to be prepared. I think we need more, more you know, awareness that not everybody is rich. Not everybody can afford to you know, work at home. And I think it just, there just needs to be more awareness in general. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, Jane, you're next. Like Jerry, I would also put five or 10 bucks in that collection bin. <laughs> um, but what you all have been talking about really has spread so many thoughts loose for me. Um, just thinking about the topic of this webinar, so decolonizing science journalism, sounds like we're kind of getting into two prongs of that, right? So one is uh, the writing itself, the reporting, what we're actually reporting about uh, underrepresented communities but also the process of reporting and what it's like in a newsroom. Um, and one thing that I really wanted to highlight is that a lot of these issues, especially with uh, a lack of diversity in newsrooms, it's a structural thing. Um, and I think it really impacts the kind of stories you can tell. Um, and even if you do have people of color in your newsroom, there are time constraints and effort involved in building trust with these communities that I think are really worthy investments that, um, I mean, from just a moral perspective, but also from a improving your work perspective. Um, so if anyone uh, here right now is in a position of power, I would really encourage you to give your reporters the space to build their networks and educate themselves because these things take time and effort and reporters are not always given time to really explore that. Um, and something else Shalina was talking about um, and that 
Jerry touched on, I, I see this as kind of um, an investment in people and not ideas. Um, instead of, like Shalina mentioned, going into a story thinking you already know the story, really taking the time to listen to people and to also report on their joy and their accomplishments alongside, you know, issues in those communities. Um, I feel like the, there's a rich tapestry of human experience there and um, all too often what we see is just one side of that. Um, and then kind of to go back to something Jerry mentioned as well, thinking about your audience. Um, one thing I see really often is um, the invocation of the word we in reporting. And I think that is a really easy way to fall back on trying to connect with your reader, but asking yourself, right, um, who, who are my readers? And what I'm describing is, is we an appropriate way of doing that? Like for instance, I'll often see, um, kind of lifestyle-y pieces about like, well, we all know what it's like to travel and like how, a, how annoying the TSA pre-check line is. And it's like, well, you know, that, that might not be we, that's maybe not all of your audience. Um, so I would really just encourage folks to think more about who was included in that we. Thank you, Jane, for sharing that important point. Uh, we're gonna kick it off right now with some Q and A from the audience. So please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A box below, and we'll do our best to answer all of the questions we're getting. Uh, we're gonna start off first. Uh, this is a question from Tiffany Fox. Uh, for Jerry or anyone else who has suggestions, um, how can science writers best inform communities of color who've had historically or justifiably, justifiably mistrustful relationship with healthcare providers about the importance of getting a COVID vaccination? Um, who would like to, to, to dive in and answer that question from Tiffany? Jerry. Hi, Tiffany, thank you for asking that question. So it's odd because I've actually been thinking about that a lot. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not gonna rush out and get the vaccine <laughs> um, because truthfully the African-American community has had some difficulties with science and medicine dating back you know, well before the Tuskegee experiment. Um, I think what needs to happen is we tend to trust people who look like us or are in the same boat as us. So if I, you know, I'm seeing a report from a young blonde writer uh, or reporter and she's saying, yeah, it's safe. I don't know, you know, like today, for example, three of the former presidents said that they were gonna take the vaccine to show that it's safe. Well, that's good for them, but their, their arterial motive is they get vaccinated. Um, to answer your question, I think, you know, by showing the people that David discussed, you know, the volunteers, the researchers, the fact that we're part of the equation to help the universe, um, that's the type of stories that we need to see and then once we see those, then maybe, you know, more people will rush out and take the vaccine. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, yeah, so um, I think that's a really good question. Um, and I think since this webinar is called Decolonizing Science Writing, I think it's important for us to sort of flip that question, right? Um, I don't think it's necessarily the responsibility of communities of color to all of a sudden make themselves comfortable with the healthcare providers that have done them a disservice for set, you know decades, centuries. Um, you go into any like underserved community with predominantly people of color, and you'll see that they're shuttered hospitals, um, healthcare centers, and so I think that asking communities of color to to overcome the anxieties that they have about a system that's failed them um, maybe isn't the best approach. Um, I think as science writers, the way that we can really flip that is by highlighting the ways in which those communities have figured out how to persevere despite those anxieties. Um, one really good example that I came across is, um, for example, United Women of East Africa group. They invite a doctor Doctor who they're comfortable with um, to uh, check up on people in their community because that person might speak Somali or might have a translator or um, is understanding of their um, 
their their cultural norms um and that's how they've uh, overcome that anxiety right and i think what we can do as science writers is to highlight those examples and provide them for healthcare providers to figure out how they can reach those communities better because they traditionally have not done so um so you know i think as science writers we hold that power because we are the ones who can go out into communities and build the trust and get people to tell us what they need in order to feel comfortable getting a vaccination. And it's up to those healthcare providers to take that advice and, and figure out how to um, make the, the distribution of the vaccine more equitable. Um, so yeah, I think that's one way in which we as science writers can um, break this norm. Thanks. Uh, the next question uh, is from Siri Carpenter. She asks, uh, what resources do you think science writers and other journalists, uh, not necessarily science journalists, uh, need in order to build skills in decolonizing their work? Uh, anyone have any thoughts on that? I guess for me, I, I always, when I'm, you know, writing about uh, something that is, uh, I'm not sure about the uh, uh, inequities involved or exactly how to cover it. I basically, basically for me, it ends up uh, involving more reporting. I have to do talk to a lot more people and uh, sometimes uh, get a later deadline than my editor initially planned. Um, but I, I don't have any like uh, go-to uh, resources. Um, does anyone else have any suggestions? Uh, if not, we can go to uh, another question. Um, there's, uh, so here's a question from Monica May. She asks, could you share any examples of a, of a, of a response to, this isn't important enough to cover, that has worked or, or changed someone's initial response? So I think she's asking like, if, if, if you, you know, pitch something to an editor and they're, you know, on the fence, uh, you know, uh, what have you said that have, that have, have gotten that uh, story, uh, you know, to fruition? Okay, let's go to Jane. So I noticed that um, no one else had their hand up here, but this isn't, I hope that this is helpful in some way, but it's not unfortunately a direct response to your question. I can honestly say, I don't think I've ever experienced a situation in which I've approached an editor with an idea who just is convinced that the story about you know, that involves people's identity in some ways, just not interesting. Um, I found instead it's been much more fruitful to move on and try and find an editor who is supportive of that and can really help that story flourish and become the piece that it's meant to be. Um, because honestly, if the editor is not on board and you have to convince them, chances are pretty good that it's going to kind of clip your wings as a reporter as well, um, that it's going to make it more likely that that story isn't going to do justice to what, to the story that you actually want to tell. Okay, Jerry, you had something to say about that too? Yeah, I have actually had that happen, but uh, not here in San Diego. I lived in Portland, Oregon for a stint in my career. And um, we had a situation where uh, some of the uh, Latino uh, workers in town, they were having some health issues and it got to my attention and I wanted my television station to do something on it. And I, I was in management at the time. And I remember my news director said, well, no one cares about them. And I had to say, I care about them. And if I care about them, then other people care about them. And we literally had, you know, this long 30 minute discussion about whether to cover this story. And I finally won her over by saying, what if this were you and your circle of friends? Would you care about this? And that's what clicked and made, you know, that person decide to do the story. I think, you know, the thing is with, any story that you do, you have to connect. People connect with people, not concepts and ideas. So you got to bring the people into it. And, and you know, I think David said this earlier, uh, 
with the coronavirus, it's become like a numbers thing. You have to just show that if you care, other people care and, you know, push those people forward. Because remember, as journalists, we are storytellers and truth tellers and truth seekers. And, you know, especially in science writing, you guys have facts, more like scientific evidence on your side to help you prove your stories. But again, you got to push the people first. Um, Shalina, you had a response too? Yeah. Um, I think for most editors, um, the, or at least in radio, from what I've experienced in broadcast, um, and this could be helpful for PR people too that are pitching science stories, um, because I know this is difficult. Um, but most of the time, the story that has some sort of connection to human life or human experience is going to be more appealing to a newsroom or an editor um, rather than scientific literature that is really hard for an audience to connect to. Um, I think that's the first tip really for convincing someone that a story is important to cover is to figure out, like Jerry was kind of talking about, how to make it related to people because that's what we do as journalists is we make information relatable to the person on the other side of the screen or the other side of the radio or the other side of the TV um, and help them resonate with it. If it's really difficult to do that with a scientific story, then it's really likely that an editor is gonna pass it up. Um, and it's up to us as journalists to figure out how to make the story relevant to people as well. Um, but for, for, for PR folks, um, that's, that's just one tip or experience that I've had um, in science writing. Thanks, Shalina. We have another question here from Aliyah uh, for the panel. When you interview national experts, immunologists, doctors, what questions do you find most helpful to ask to bring the focus to the marginalized communities most affected by the pandemic? Uh, Jerry, would you like to take a stab at uh, answering this question to start? Hi, thank you. So I think that, the, let me, I'm gonna answer this in a weird way. So with the coronavirus, the main person we've been seeing is Dr. Anthony Fauci. And he's someone with decades of experience, you know, in infectious diseases and other things. The thing that I find lacking is we don't see enough people of color speaking on this issue, but the people who are being affected disproportionately are people of color. And so, you know, when you're doing a story like this, you have to look at the facts and look at the numbers and, and go, who's benefiting from this and who's not benefit, benefit, I don't know why I can't speak all of a sudden, who's not benefiting from this and then pursue that story in that angle. Um, I have yet to see a black doctor or a black team, like for example, Howard University has a great medical school. Where are they in this? They're sitting in DC. What's going on? You know, Tuskegee has a great medical school. Where are they? And, and they're historically black colleges. I know historically black colleges are contributing to the effort. Where are they? You know, and these are nationally known schools. So, I mean, I guess my point in this question is dig a little deeper, you know, not just don't go to the tried and true people who will give you the sound bite you want. Try to find the people who will give you the information that you really need. Thanks, Jerry. Jane, would you like to give a little bit of insight on this as well? I totally agree with Jerry here that digging deeper is, I think, the only way to go. Um, I mean, a lot of these national experts or immunologists actually are people of color. Um, they might not be the ones who are interviewed the most, but they certainly are out there. And I think that um, while it might take a little bit more time or it might take um, a few more attempts as a lot, a lot of those experts are quite busy and swamped with media requests, um, it is absolutely worth doing if you have the time. And 
going back to something I mentioned earlier, if you're in a position of power, I think trying to give your reporters a little more leeway and time to make those connections and um, wait to hear back from those folks who are extremely busy can be really valuable. I know that not every story lends itself to that, but especially if you have some flexibility in your lead time, um, those perspectives are really valuable and necessary. Thanks, Jane. Um, Esther asks a question that uh, I've been thinking about lately too. Um, uh, she says there's an inherent tension between needing to be um, quote unquote objective as a journalist on the one hand, and then taking time to listen, build trust and empathize with sources from um, underrepresented groups whose views are often unpopular, inconvenient uh, or, or challenge dominant thinking. And so I was wondering if any of you, uh, maybe we'll start with Shalina, if any of you have any suggestions on how to you know, walk this, this, uh, this line um, on, uh, uh, you know, building trust with underrepresented sources while not coming across as too much as, you know, like advocacy journalism. Yeah, um, I, I have a great example of, of how I've had to approach that um, with sources that I absolutely don't agree with. Um, for example, I was doing a story in Nashville about the removal of a Confederate statue um, and in order to be balanced um, in the story about, you know, who in this town wants this versus who doesn't, um, I had to interview uh, members of the Daughters of the Confederacy um, in Tennessee. It was a very weird experience for me personally as a person of color doing that interview. Um, but the thing that I keep in the back of my mind as a journalist, especially doing diversity reporting, is that you have to be able to step outside of your own preconceived notions, um, no matter how right you think they are, and offer the person in front of you a chance to speak their mind and express why they feel the way they feel. And put that down on paper in a way that is fair and equitable across all of the people that you're interviewing. Um, that's your role as a journalist. Um, despite how much you might disagree with the person you're talking to, but you can give, you can highlight those voices that you think are really important. Um, and so my advice for, for anyone who's like trying to toe the line, especially when it comes to advocacy groups where you're like, this group is clearly right in what they're wanting, um, is to provide an inform enough information, enough factual evidence that guides your listener towards the conclusions that you're hoping that they come to or that allows them to fairly come up with those conclusions, but you're providing enough facts and enough objective information for them to come up with that perspective on their own. Thanks, Shalina. Uh, David, uh, you're next. Thank you, Ramin. You know, this is, this is, we're living in a time when science isn't trusted and journalists aren't trusted, which makes our jobs even more difficult than they've ever been before. But this year has convinced me in many ways that journalists objectivity has been outstanding in 2020 in spite of what you may hear. Now to the point about maintaining objectivity, I think there's a distinction between subjectivity and critical thinking. And it's important when you're interviewing anyone, uh, whether you agree with them or not, that you listen and that you critically think about the information and the feedback that you are getting. I think critical thinking, which of course is a hallmark of academia, and it, it should be in, in our profession as well. I think critical thinking helps you um, balance, helps you evaluate, I think it is a safety net from uh, letting your emotions get away from you, which we're all human as journalists. But I think critical thinking and listening are so important to making smart decisions about how we gather the news and then how we go on and present it to our readers, all of our readers. Uh, th thanks, David. Um, Jane, you, you had a point to make too. Please go ahead. <laughs> 
One thing that has really helped me with this, and I've definitely struggled with it as well, is instead of thinking of it as objectivity, thinking of it as fairness, which is, I think, something Shalina touched on. Um, I actually was just talking with another journalist the other day who um, was unsure about how to approach a conversation with someone um, who was from a tribal nation. And he said he didn't really want to scare her off by saying, you know, here's the usual rundown. Can I record this conversation? Anything that you say in this conversation can be quoted in my piece. Um, he was like, well, how am I supposed to navigate the situation with the journalistic standards I've been taught um, versus what I feel like is right um, for, for me. And I think it's really helped to go into a conversation and um, like Shalina said, make sure they have a full amount of information they need to understand where the conversation might go. Um, depending on who I'm talking to, I might give people kind of a rundown on what my job is and what I'm going for in this piece and why I wanna talk with them. Um, and kind of lay out the options for how we can speak. Um, sometimes it's most comfortable for folks who are really skittish about media or don't have much experience with it to have a conversation um, on background first and then arrange for an on-record conversation later. Um, I think it looks a lot different if you're talking with folks from underrepresented communities who you know, might not um, be super comfortable with media or might have constraints um, culturally um, or from their specific role in the community um, in talking freely versus, you know, say talking with the communications person from an enormous company who does um, media interviews all day. Like, you know, you don't need to explain to them exactly um, how interviews work. Um, but I think getting that consent um, and making sure that you and your source are on the same page and building that trust from there, um, I think is just part of good journalism. Um, and I think part of being a, a good journalist is being able to make the right judgment calls in those situations um, and to kind of build on your experience and your judgment to make sure that the source's voice is being heard. Thanks, Jane. Uh, Jerry, uh, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll be real quick. Um, so a long time ago, I read this book called The Four Agreements. And one of the things it talks about is always doing your best. And so when you're out covering a story and particularly, you know, you guys are writing about some really complex issues in the world, remember you're human. And, you know, David made a point about how people are not trusting the media these days and, you know, fake news and all of this. I think when you're talking to your sources, you know, obviously you're going to be objective, but you're a person just like they are. And so if you can connect with them on a personal level in any you know, shape, form or fashion, it's gonna make them trust you. It's gonna make them open up to you more. You know, I mean, I know we live in a COVID age where we're all Zooming and that sort of thing. Even if you, know, you say, hey, I like the chair in your background or something, just some, you know, to, to try to form some sort of human connection, I think it'll go a long way you know, because right now we're all feeling pretty isolated and just connecting in any shape, form, or way that you can, I think is super important. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, this was a question that was brought up a little bit earlier and I think that uh, we have a little bit of time here in the final minutes of our webinar. Um, that was a question that Siri had. Um, thinking about a resource or maybe resources that you think folks should come away with from today's webinar. Uh, perhaps just one website or something that's resonated with you that's helped you in your work um, that might be helpful to others that are joining us today. Uh, David, why don't we start with you if you want to share one resource you'd like to have folks think about uh, when they leave today. Well, obviously this year I've been looking at a lot of websites to get information about COVID-19, among other things. And I know that they've had a rocky year, but everybody's had a rocky year. But the, actually the World Health Organization uh, website is a really, I think, dependable and solid website for information about not just COVID-19, but about scientific uh, issues uh, across the board. And I recommend people use the WHO website. Thanks, Jerry. I was just putting that in the 
the chat for everyone to see. Uh, why don't we jump over to Selena? Is there a resource or resources that you'd like to rent, recommend for folks to, to check out? Sure. Um, I don't have like a specific uh, website or title for any of these, but my best advice to anyone who's in the science writing world and wants to represent more diverse voices is to start coming up with a list of community organizations that you can make inroads with. Um, like the Chicana Federation um, that I had mentioned earlier, which has lots of um, connections to Latino communities throughout San Diego. Um, there are lots of communities here that are refugee communities. You can find City Heights organization. There's a City Heights grant um, that a lot of journalists use in San Diego, make connections with that organization. Um, just start putting together a list of groups that you want to have connections with, because that's honestly going to be the best way for you to figure out how to make your science writing relevant to underserved communities. Thanks so much, Lena. If you happen to have any of those uh, URLs handy, uh, feel free to post them in the, the chat as well for everyone. Uh, why don't we jump over to Jane? Are there any resources you'd also like to share? Usually I would say the open notebook, but I think Siri might already know about that one. Um, like Shalina, I don't have any specific resources um, or like, you know, a website to go to, but I found that the most valuable thing for me in trying to get different perspectives has been lurking, essentially. Um, I think my community Facebook groups, especially if there are special interest groups or um, people of a certain identity who have an open group that um, is open to the public to watch discussions unfold there. And also on Twitter, I just have lists of folks that um, I feel like always have really valuable perspectives, um, ones that I might not otherwise consider or that I'm not, um, you know, I don't personally belong to those communities. And that has been um, a really great learning tool over time. Thanks so much, Jane. I really appreciate it. I ended up uh, posting the open notebook uh, URL up here at, for everyone too, in case some folks may not be familiar with it. Uh, and Jerry, uh, are there any resources that you also recommend? Yeah, actually I, I have a couple. So I've been talking about diversity, diversity, diversity the entire time. Um, I wanted to bring your attention to a couple of journalism groups that are diverse. Um, the National Association of Black Journalists, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, the Asian American Journalists Association, the Native American Journalists Association. All of us have, you know, members that, that are worldwide. And if you are not a member of the community that you're covering, then maybe join these groups and they can help you find diverse voices um, as sources. So I just you know, wanted to bring that to your attention. And also the uh, NLDJA, the National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Association as well, and the Society of Professional Journalists. And there are others, but I wanted to make sure I didn't leave here without you all knowing about it. And then just personally, I mentioned the four agreements. That's just helped me just in general in life. Um, so yeah, there's that. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much, Jerry. And if you can uh, post any of those URLs as well in the chat, I was trying to post them uh, and catch it up <laughs> so we can share all of them with everyone. And uh, with that, you know, time goes so fast. Um, I can't believe it's almost one o'clock. We uh, unfortunately didn't get a chance to get to all the other questions in the Q&A. We appreciate all of you taking time out of your day to join us today and post your questions. I'm sorry, we couldn't get to all of them. We'll just have to have another one and do, do this again. <laughs> um, so basically, um, we wanted to uh, let you know that you know you can find out more about um, the San Diego Science Writers Association from the URL that we posted up in the chat if you want to know more about them and the upcoming meeting that they have. Um, we just want to say a big thank you to the School of Journalism and Media Studies uh, at, the, at SDSU and uh, for making this webinar possible today along with the San Diego Science Writers Association. Um, we also ask you to, if you could please tell us what you thought about the webinar. Um, you'll be getting a survey to tell us what you thought, um, so please fill it out. And we'd like to thank you again for joining us today. Have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.